it's time to dig in and discuss the questions on the minds of today's leaders. You are listening to The Kathleen Reason Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. This is where we get vulnerable, raw, and authentic about the stuff that really matters. Now, here is your host, Kathleen Reason. Welcome to The Kathleen Reason Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. I'm your host, Kathleen Reason, and we're here on Inspired Choices Network. I'm so excited to present today's show, and it's called, very simply, Get yourself a hobby. Get yourself a hobby. And this show, we talked a little bit about the hobbies and why they were important during our six weeks of June, which we can, our six weeks of joy, which we concluded last week. So joy being such an important part of how we show up. It is our strategic advantage when we're in a space of joy. And during these six weeks of joy, there was one point where we were talking about how do you actually create space in your life to to experience joy. It's not something that happens, oh, I will get to that. It's something that we get to experience in every moment. And so the idea of a hobby came up, having a hobby, the importance of a hobby. And I said, so many weeks ago, you can go back and listen. I said, this is so important. It deserves an entire show all to itself. So today, today, ta-da, today is get yourself a hobby. And we're gonna talk about the importance of a hobby. I'm even gonna share some of my hobbies and some of the hobbies of people that, that I respect and, and these, that some of these celebrities. <laughs> and it's really cool when you see that, that really the difference between a lot of the people that really come from a space of, of joy or productivity. So I use the word joy, but what you may see it as the people that really they handle a lot, they handle a lot. Those are the people that, that have us figured out and what they're doing in their free time is so critical to how they're showing up during their, let's say, eight to five time period. So what you do after five o'clock or before 8 a.m. is so critical to what how you show up in your eight to five time, but we don't often think about that. There was a study that was done that said, of all the executives that this study was done, it was like 500 executives, only 10% of these executives had hobbies. Yet that 10%, when you linked it to their performance, guess which executives were performing at higher levels the 10%. So uh, one of the things that I've often heard is that people will say, my plate's so full. I don't have time for another hobby. And here's the deal. It's not about fitting more into your plate. If your plate's full, you can't fit any more on your plate. Got it. Now the challenge is get a bigger plate, get a bigger plate. And that's in the, the transformational study work that I've done. That literally means transform how you're showing up. If you are full, then you got to look at that and say, what am I doing that I don't have to be doing? Because when we think about hobbies, it's about creating a space in our brains. We studied all last week. I brought on my dad, who's a neuroscientist, and we went way deep into neuroscience and the, the effects of emotions on our brain. And what I took from that was how important in our brain development it is that we, we don't focus on metrics all the time. We can't focus on just one thing all the time. We will burn out that area of our brain. So I looked up some different hobbies and why they were important. And you'll find this fascinating and because if you've watched my show for a while, you know how I work, I can research and I can, I can put information in my mind, but that recall of information, those details, it's not always there for me. So guess what? I have notes here and I'm going to reference it. And I'm telling you this because that's okay. Like it's okay to do that. And sometimes we hold ourselves to a space where that's not okay. We've got to be perfect. We've got to memorize it. And that's just not the case. So this is my permission to myself and to the rest of the world to say it is okay to reference notes. So here is me referencing notes. So this is, I'm going to tie in some of the details of the brain. So these hobbies, dancing, circus arts, music, theater, and sports. A dancing, circus arts, music, theater, and sports. They are all linked to strengthening executive functioning. Like, isn't that cool? So if you want to strengthen your executive functioning, which is your critical decision making, uh, how you show up and how you, how you lead others, they are linked to dancing, circus arts, music, theater, and sports. Are there others? Sure. But these are just a few that are mentioned. Then you think about strategic games like chess. So my 10-year-old my loves chess, and he actually got me into playing chess. And we play, when, he, when he was in school, he was homeschooled this past year. But when he was in school, we would go at 7.15 every Friday morning and we play chess. So when everyone else is just getting up, getting ready for school, here is my 10-year-old and his buddies 
playing chess and strategic games like chess. Another one that I grew up playing is called Mastermind. Maybe you guys have seen it. There's little pegs in it and you want to, you challenge the other player. It's a two player game. You challenge the other player to guess what color of your pegs are, the color and the order of your pegs. And it's a really challenging game, but it really hones in on critical thinking. And this one improves brain plasticity, brain plasticity. And that is the flowing part of your brain, really how you form new connections in your mind. So really the growth of your brain is, is supported by critical strategic thinking games like chess. So I thank my 10 year old for keeping me sharp because chess supports us in keeping us sharp and other games, but a lot of card games too are strategic thinking games like solitaire. We play a lot of solitaire in our house. And that's another one where it's supporting us in creating their new neuron, new neural connections. My dad would be so proud of me using this language. <laughs> I just got a question, does Uno count? Absolutely. And Uno counts as far as how, you, how you're forming different connections as well. So we play Uno a lot. We play this, the new one, Uno Flip. If you guys have seen that, it's a challenge. My eight-year-old loves Uno Flip. And the whole point of Uno is we see a challenge, we quickly solve it based on what's in our hands. So we're seeing, let's say, a red eight that's in front of us. I think, okay, I can play a red or an eight. What do I have in my hand? Do I have a wild card or draw four? Do I have a red? Do I have an eight? Do I, what do I have that I can now play? So the distinction that I talk about a lot, how we show up anywhere is how we show up everywhere. Which that means that if we practice knowing that we have a challenge and we quickly solve that challenge, that's what we want to practice. That's the piece of saying, hey, we've got cards in front of us. We've got a challenge in front of us and I've got potential solutions. Which one's going to work? And I'm just constantly telling myself, okay, challenge, possible solutions. Which one am I going to use? That's the exact same thing we do in the boardroom. It's the exact same thing when we show up to work that we're doing. We're saying challenge, possible solutions, which we want to pick. Let's go. So these games that we're teaching our kids at such young ages, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, all on up, we're really teaching them challenge, potential solutions, which should I pick? Challenge, potential solutions, which should I pick? And then here's the beauty of it. This is why hobbies are so important. Then we layer on emotions. So for those of you that have kids, of course, you know, I have three. They don't, don't always enjoy losing. So my eight-year-old hates to lose to the point where we've actually said he's not allowed to play Monopoly voice. He's played the other Monopoly games, but he's not allowed to play the Monopoly voice edition with his brothers because he hates to lose it. He gets so mad about losing this game. And think about that. Now we're saying challenge. Solutions are in our hand, which one are we going to pick with the Uno example. Now we're adding in consequences. So now we're seeing that based on what you choose, there's going to be consequences. In this case, you're going to win or you're going to lose. And that's where we are learning from our hobbies, everything that we can apply in life and in work. So something that seems fun, but is fun, it's a game. We can apply that same lesson. And that's one of the reasons that hobbies are so valuable. So strategic games like chess improve brain plasticity. Now a musical instrument, I played the tenor sax growing up. My 12 year old is studying the trombone and he's really, this is his third year playing and you can hear that his tonguing and his flow is improving. And that's really cool to see his dedication. He practices 15 minutes a day. Most days we don't have to remind him, but some days we do. So he's learning perseverance and dedication and commitment and being his word because he shows up for his music lessons every week. And his dad and I, my husband and I, we remind him, remind Kate, our, our 12 year old, we say, Kate, you're going to show up at lessons and we're not there because he gets out of the car. We drop him off. He goes into his lesson and then it's on him with his instructor and his instructor, my, my former band instructor, Myron, Mr. Myron is what Caden calls him. And Mr. Myron says, how did practicing go this week? And it's not, you know, we're not there to, to comfort him, to, to console him, to make up an answer. This is him confronting him. And he's the one that gets to say, I practiced all seven days and it went well, or I practiced all seven days and I had a challenge with this, or I didn't practice. Whatever that is, he's the one that gets to come up and own that. So the hobby for him is such a great lesson on perseverance, commitment, 
being your word. So there's lots of things that he's learning that he can apply directly into the boardroom or at work, but he's also improving, though this is a big word, okay? He's also improving his corpus colossum. I'm gonna say it that way. I don't, it could be colossum, I don't know, but the corpus colossum. And, and what that is, now I do know what that is, is that it's the left and right hemispheres of the brain. It's the connection between the two. So if you go back and listen last week, we talked about the different parts of the brain. This is actually the connection between the two. And so who knew that playing an instrument actually strengthened our brain? Like, how cool. And I think about, I haven't picked up my saxophone for quite a while, but wow, it, that'd be a fun hobby because now I know it's going to actually connect parts of my brain. That's really cool. Last week, we talked about we can teach a dog new tricks. Well, this is a way to do that. This is a way to do that. And then the last one, learning a new language. Okay, when we learn a new language like Spanish or French or Russian or whatever you want to learn, there's there's hundreds, I mean, thousands of different dialects that we can learn. It actually improves our cognitive functioning. So but that's pretty powerful when we think about all those different experiences that we can have simply by hobbies, simply by something that we could enjoy. And it can be something as simple as cards. It could be skipping rocks. It could be painting. It doesn't matter what the hobby is. What matters is that we are focused on something that doesn't have to do with our normal job. Now, as executives, think about this. We spend most of our days making decisions, looking at metrics, being held the timelines. If that's all we thought about all the time, we would burn out that portion of our brain. And now all of a sudden we would be less effective at making decisions, at timelines, at some of those critical things. So what happens is we wanna put ourselves into a state of flow, which means pure enjoyment. We want to put ourselves in that space that's totally different than our work. And so that is the value of a hobby. Here's another example. Think about at work. If you're on the top of your game at work, so you are, you are, let's say you're the CEO. So if you're on top of the game, who knows? But you're playing at the peak level. When you are the executive, as, as you know, it can be really isolating. Because who are you gonna, who are you gonna issue your challenge to? When you say I'm having this challenge, when most of the people around you can't quite understand where you're coming from. But now, let's say you play archery. And you're on a team that goes and plays archery. Well, it doesn't matter who the other person is. If you're committed to archery, there could be a team of 15 people that all are committed to upping their archery game. And now all of a sudden, you've got connection. And you've got connection in solving your challenges because you want to know how should you aim so that you can hit a bullseye. And maybe the person next to you who's way better at archery can support you in that or bowling. Let's just like really picking hobbies where you're not that great. And that's the beauty of it. Where the person next to you is way better than you so that you can learn because it reminds us to be humble. It reminds us that, that there is gifts in each one of us. And while we may be at the top of our game in one area of our life, we can be at the bottom of our game in another. And that's okay. That's okay. So being at the bottom of our game means that we have a place to grow. And this is the thing that I see that stops a lot of executives. We reach the top of our game and we don't know where to go. I faced this problem. This was, when I was 33, I was awarded the silver medalist award for the American Advertising Federation. And this is a, it's a really nice award and I was honored to receive it, but here I am 33 years old. I mean, yes, I've had an agency now for seven years, but I felt like I had peaked. And this is an award that you typically get 70s, 80s, 90s, death. And yet here I was being awarded this, this award. And I felt like I had peaked. But because I had these hobbies, these some of these other hobbies, I realized that there was lots of other growth area and potential for me. And that was really supportive in getting me through that time period knowing that we can be really strong in one area, but it's okay to put ourselves into positions where we're not going to be that strong. Because but guess what? We're always gonna find those positions where we're gonna be on the bottom and we get to work our way to the top, we get to study and grow. And so that is really powerful when we can do it, when it's our choice and it's always our choice, but when we can do it in a fun way, like archery or bowling or something that we're not that great at, that we have growth opportunities. 
So guys, we are going to take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll cover in more depth this topic about getting ourselves a hobby and not just ourselves. We as executives get to open up the space where other people around us get to have hobbies. We get to encourage our employees to have hobbies and share with them the reasons and the values of having a hobby. So enjoy this quick break. You're listening to Kathleen Reeson show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. I'll talk to you here in just a sec. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspire Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspire Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. I'm your host, Kathleen Reeson, and we're here on Inspired Choices Network. I want to get real about something here. So we're talking about the value of getting a hobby. So the value of getting a hobby and why it's so important. But what we're going to get real about is why, if this is so important, do not, not many people have hobbies. So I'm in a room a few weeks ago, I'm speaking, and I asked the question, how many of you have a hobby? And this is such a typical answer. It fits every single study that I've ever seen. So a third of the room raises their hand saying, I don't have a hobby. A third of the room is like, no way will I raise my hand. And a third of the room is just like, yeah, yep, I got all kinds of hobbies. This is so exciting. I am lit up and I got all these hobbies. And I'm so glad she brought this up. And the question is, if we understand the value, so let's just, let's just say people get why it's important to not focus on work all the time. I have yet to have a conversation where someone believes that focusing on work 100% of the time, other than eating and sleeping and like, caring for kids, I'm yet to have a conversation where someone says, yeah, I totally get that. I get why, why it's not, I shouldn't, we, we inherently understand the value of doing something other than work. But the question that I ask is, so why is it that if we understand that it's so important, why don't we all have hobbies? Why don't, why don't we create these in our lives? And, and that's where we get to dig in here because inherently we get it. We get that we get that we get to have the space and create it. But uh, I'm 39 years old. I have three children. They're eight, 10, 12. They're in their own hobbies. I'm married. I get to put food on the table, meaning I literally get to prepare the food and put it on the table. I have a house that gets to say somewhat clean. I have clothes that get to be washed and put away in some way. We've got a lot of stuff on our plates. And could we outsource some of it? Sure. Could we get somebody to mow our lawn? Can we get somebody to clean the house? Can we get support? I mean, really, could we even get somebody to drive our kids around or a nanny that would, sure, there's all those things. And yet, I meet people all the time that have all of those luxuries and they still don't create time for hobbies, even though they know that's really important. And what I see is that there's a worthiness piece below this. We tell ourselves that we get to work all the time to get where we want. And it's this formula, and I believe I shared it with the show, with you guys on the show, but I'm gonna share it again. And it's called Be, Do, Have. Be, Do, Have. So if you wrote that down, it would be B, period, space, do, period, space, have, period, no space because it's the end of the sentence. Be, do, have. And here in the United States where I'm from, but in most Western civilizations, 
we actually live in a do have B, do have B. And so we flipped the equation around. And what that means is I will do whatever I have to do. I will work 80, 90, 100 hours a week so that I can have the nice house or the great car or the awesome vacation. And then when I do that, I will be free. I will be joyful. I will be patient. I will be tranquil, whatever that is. But what happens is we get so caught up in the doing, the extra work to have what we have. And then we're taking care of the stuff that we have that we never get to the be, which means we don't get to the joy, the, the patience, the freedom, the tranquility, what we really, really want. And so the, it's, how you see this is that you go to a third world country, okay? If you've ever been to a third world country, you know exactly what I mean. There are people that are so impoverished and you drive down the street. If you can drive down the street, you might not even be able to because the roads might be so poor. They might be dirt and you might not be able to get a car by. Maybe it's a bicycle, but somehow you end up on this road and you're looking at these houses that are more like shacks where the water is coming off of the the makeshift roof into a barrel, and that's what they utilize for their drinking. So, so you know what I'm talking about. Like, these are not places that you would want to live if you compare to the amenities that we have in our house versus there. And yet, these people have smiles on their faces and they genuinely seem joyful and just totally at peace. And you think, how is that possible? They don't have Wi-Fi, internet, uh, the latest cell phones. They don't even have a great tasting food. And they don't have these things that, that we really consider critical to our lives. And yet they're so joyful. And how does that happen? And the reality is they have this formula figured out and we flipped it around. They know that they want to be joyful. They can be joyful just because they say so. And then they'll do what they get to do and then they'll have what they have to have, but they don't focus on the having. There's a, there was a saying, a video that I watched a few years ago, and it was this guy and he, he was really solemn. And he says, I hope you enjoy your $300,000 income so that you can buy your million dollar house and you can drive in your yellow Ferrari that you park at your work all day long. And that when you get home, you're so exhausted that the kids that you longed for with your spouse, that you think the world of, you don't ever get to see. When you're home, you're so exhausted from your job to buy that house, to buy that car, that you just go right to bed. The laundry doesn't get done, you pay somebody to interact with your kids and it goes on and on and on and on. And it talks about this cycle of really getting away from the B space. And it's really interesting if you look at, like, especially again here in the United States where I'm from, what happened from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And we, if you look back to the 50s, we had the, the modern family was you know, two parents and you know, 2.5 kids. Let's just call it two or three. It doesn't matter. Let's call it two for the sake of this conversation. So two parents, two kids. So that was our nuclear family. And you had one parent that was working and one parent that was at home. So we didn't have these giant like, mega houses that we have now, but you know, there, was, there was plenty. If you look back at that time, there was absolutely families that struggled, but the average family, the, the middle class was born at that time and there was safety and security and enough food. And so they really had what we consider to be enough. And then we, as we get into the 60s, the 70s even, where we started to get into two-parent households. And then in the 80s, it was the whole latchkey kid movement, where what we saw was a lot of these, these parents were working, so kids would either stay home by themselves, or they would be in daycares. Like Daycares became a real big business. And as it grew into the 80s, 90s, 2000s, where we're at today, we've got a lot of parents that are in high-profile positions, and the kids are at daycare either all day, so from like 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., or in this wraparound care around school. Well, COVID was such an interesting experience for all of us because it really just reset all of that. And now we're in a, a period of time where a lot of these families, and then, you know, my family included, we're saying, what, are we, what pieces are we going to put back into place here? 
Are we both going to go back to the jobs and the levels that we were performing at, or are we going to reinvent how we're performing because we want to spend more time with our kids or you know, whatever that looks like? And I'm not making any of this right or wrong because it's not about what I think or what anybody else thinks. It's what's, what works for you and for your family. But what happens is when we get caught in this do or this have, we get away from the be. And the be is where we attach our hobbies. It's that place where we just get to be free. We get to be joy and fun. And so when I, when I for me, it's bowling. I, I love to bowl. Uh, that would be a stretchy hobby for me. Not because it's hard for me, but it's because it's something that I do infrequently. I used to bowl when I was younger. I was actually on a tournament team. Uh, tournament's a big word. I, I, I bowled like, on Saturdays when I was in elementary school. And it was a lot of fun. And so now as an adult, I have some skills, but I'm not a great bowler. Like, I'm not going to get a turkey, like, three strikes in a row. Uh, consistently, but you know, can I bowl 150, 160? Sure. That's a, that's a decent game. And so I know that I have growth opportunities and my oldest says, Hey mom, let's join a bowling league together. Okay. Well, that sounds kind of fun. That, that, that could be fun because for both of us, it's just a place where we get to be unattached to whether we're number one, we don't care. We're just there to have a good time. Now I'm sure there's somebody there that wants to win and that's cool because that's always the case. There's always going to be somebody that wants it harder than us unless we are that person. And so it's an opportunity for us to grow. And I love that. But if I'm so busy in my working, in my doing, I miss that opportunity. And so I, and what I know to be true is that oftentimes we spend so much time in the doing that we tell ourselves We'll get to that. We'll get to that fun. We'll get to that joy. And what I'm here to tell you in this moment is that you're worthy. You're enough. And, and when you create that space for yourself to just be joy, to just, just be in a hobby, that's where the magic comes in. Every single time I get stuck and I can't figure out where the next step is, I know I get to surrender. And that is something that I, I can say that word, it can come out of my mouth, but I'll tell you what, it's, I have put years, the last two years, I have practiced surrender and it's one of the hardest things, hardest things, because I made it that way, really just trusting, underneath surrender is trust, like really trusting that I'm on the right path. And a lot of the things that I work with, now see if this resonates with you, but most of the things that I, the projects that I work on, they're really long-term, which means the work that I put in today, I'm not going to see the results from it for maybe six months, a year, two years, three years. They're really long-term. And naturally, I am a controller. So there's different communication styles. We've talked about it on the show. I'll even do some more shows here in the next month or so that we're going to dig even deeper into that. But I am a natural controller which means that I want to see results quickly. I want to see the results of my work. And so I know that about me. I'm highly self-aware. And I know what happens when I don't create opportunities for results for myself. I tell myself it's not working and I want to quit that task and move on to the next one that is going to work. But when you commit to playing such a long game, which as executives, that's what we're doing. We are playing long-term games. We get to create opportunities for short-term wins. And that's where hobbies have been so important for me. So my hobbies, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about my hobbies. My hobbies are anything in the creative space. So I love utilizing my hands. I like painting or drawing or uh, crocheting. I recently, I used to crochet when I was younger and I took up crocheting and I made this beautiful blanket for my husband. So I thought, well, that wasn't too bad. So then I went to make this barn and it was for my nephew. It was a play barn all kinds of different components. It looked like an egg, you guys. It wasn't, a, wasn't it look like a barn, look like an egg. And what I found so fascinating about that is it wasn't a big deal. I didn't stress about it. I just laughed and I realized, nah, I'll make him a blanket. And I got to move on. But how many times in our lives, in our, in our work, are we attached to it? And when we screw it up, we make ourselves wrong for it. But in the value of hobbies, in the, the world of hobbies, it doesn't matter. It's okay. It's not that big of a deal. So you think biking, that could be a hobby. But for Lance Armstrong, for example, you know, he had a big oops, not that long ago in sports. You know, and uh, for those of you who know, you know, and 
So for Lance, he made his business biking. Biking is not his hobby. Biking is not a space where he could not think about metrics. When he committed to that for his work and his passion, it no longer was his hobby. So very different experience for someone like that who's somebody else's hobby is their job. When I was in college, I had, I had a double major in advertising and accounting. There was a period of time when I went to school where I was in the school of design. And I was really, I had a good time the first few months. And I quickly realized design is not for me. I'm not a designer, <laughs> but I really enjoyed that creative space. And what I found was that, and, and listening to these words very carefully, I couldn't major in my hobby. Once I said that to one of my business partners and he heard that design was a hobby. I said, no, 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 no. Design isn't a hobby, but it's my hobby. So just like Lance Armstrong's profession is biking, it also can't be his hobby back. So the one that, the, the thing that you get to commit to, that's not your hobby, okay? So a lot of people say, my work is my hobby. And I'm here to say that is not the case, simply not true. So we're gonna go on a quick break. And when we get back, we're gonna dig into some of these people that, that you probably have heard of that have some really cool hobbies. So you can see what some example hobbies would be. We'll even give some tips on how you can encourage the people around you and yourself to create a hobby. So enjoy this quick break. You're listening to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. We'll be back just after this message. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. I'm your host, Kathleen Reeson, and we're here on Inspired Choices Network. And for the past 30 minutes, we've been talking all about getting a hobby. Hobbies are a lot of fun, but they have a lot of benefits beyond just something fun to do. As we talked about, they actually help the brain. They help us with cognitive function and so many other benefits. And one of the things that we get to highlight here is other people that have hobbies. Because hobbies, let's be honest, they're just, they're so valuable. So here's someone, if I had visuals here, I'd show you a picture of Meryl Streep. And so Meryl Streep actually took up knitting. And Meryl Streep took up knitting. And the, the cool thing about that is when she was in her productions, so her movie productions, she knit some of her attire. So some of the scarves that she wore, she actually knit them. And she said it was something that kept her mind off of whatever her project was. And it helped her even be in the space, especially if she was playing somebody who maybe maybe enjoyed knitting or some different activities. She would, she would utilize some of those hobbies and take them on herself to really find that role. So for her, knitting was her space. Julia Roberts is the same way. She also enjoys knitting. I think there's a whole knitting club in Hollywood. Another person is Richard Branson. So actually chess is one of Richard Branson's pastimes. And I just read about kite surfing as well, something that he really loves. If you guys know Richard Branson, if you've studied anything about him, he loves an adventure. He loves being on the edge. And it's why that one of the things that really started him in creating Virgin the Virgin Airlines and uh, the entertainment group and all the different things that he's into is because it was an adventure for him. And so just like kite surfing is an adventure for him, he, he found an outlet in areas like that or chess where he says, I love chess because I often get beat. Now, do you get beat in the airline industry? Sure, especially over the last year, but there are very few people that can beat him just because there aren't many competitors in the airline industry. 
it is not a big place. But do you know how many chess players there are? My 10 year old would love to play Richard Branson in chess, not because he cares that Richard Branson is Richard Branson. He could, he doesn't even know who Richard Branson is, but he would love to play somebody that could, he could learn something from. He'd love to play somebody that he could compete with. He doesn't, when you're playing chess, it doesn't matter what skills you have in the boardroom. It's about what skills you bring to the chess game. And so that's why having this hobby is so important for Richard Branson, chess or kite surfing. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has such a cool, I, I've never seen Warren Buffett with this hobby, but I'm, I'm going to. He plays the ukulele. And so what I've heard is that a lot of their, their board, the big board meetings that he hosts, he actually plays his ukulele and he has a band. So he gets everybody together. And he says, I don't care if we sound awesome or horrible. It doesn't matter because we have so much fun. So that is, again, the value. And you're showing, as an executive, you're showing your humility and your humbleness when you get up and play the ukulele. I thought one time that when I was speaking, I was going to bring out a guitar and say, I learned this song just for you. Now I've never done that. But it sounds really neat to do that and because I don't play the guitar. But then if you learn something like that and you show that I'm learning too, you add that human element. So you're actually, as an executive, really showing to your employees, like, here's a way for you to be vulnerable. And we can talk all about vulnerability and why that gets to happen in the workplace. But ultimately, having this hobby is so important for Warren Buffett. The ukulele and showing that this is something that he's passionate about. He has interests outside of work. So that's really important. Brad Pitt, <laughs> this one, it just makes me laugh. Okay, Brad Pitt spins pottery. He actually, he and Matt Damon get together quite often. Uh, Brad Pitt had a whole pottery studio built. I, I had no idea about this until I started digging into it. He had a whole pottery, like a kiln, everything built into part of his house so that he could have these pottery parties. And so he invites these, these other actors and actresses from the films that he's on over to his house to have these pottery parties. How cool. It, you think about... Well, what, what do you do besides like drink alcohol with people? So a lot of times, uh, especially in early adulthood, but uh, even mid, mid adulthood, you don't see it as much in late adulthood, but alcohol becomes a, a really big comforter. So some people say, well, we just get together with our friends and we drink. That's what we do in our free time. Well, what you'll notice is that a lot of executives, they don't drink. I don't, I don't drink. I wouldn't say I never drink, but I've had maybe one drink in the last two years it just doesn't have an appeal to me and I thought I was unique in this but what I really what I don't like about alcohol is I don't like having something impair me just that's not fun for me and I don't like those senses in my body that are unusual it's very uncomfortable for me to have the the feeling of alcohol in my body so I just don't drink and some people do and that's okay but what I noticed is a trend that the higher up in an organization you go you're going one of two ways. It's either alcohol is something that you turn to as a, a relaxer, or it's something that you stay away from and then you find these other areas. So this is not, again, don't hear it as drinking alcohol is a bad thing. And uh, just think about how you choose to use your time outside of the office, because that's really what this is about. So Brad Pitt has pottery. And what's so cool about this is that his uh, former love interest, ex-wife, on again, off again person, Angelina Jolie, she collects knives as her hobby. So can you even imagine you've got Brad Pitt who's got his pottery wheel spinning and then you've got Angelina Jolie throwing knives and weapons around, but that is her hobby. And if you notice some of the movies that she's been in, she actually utilizes that hobby. So she, she shows that her tricks. And I, read, I listened to an interview about her saying that how exciting it is when she gets to meld those two worlds for a little bit and showcase her hobby. So that was pretty cool that she's found that combination. And then another one that's really cool, you guys might know this guy as DJ B. Saul. I hadn't heard of him before a few years ago when I dug into values of hobbies, but DJ D. Saul, he's got, if you just looked at DJ D. Saul, you would think, wow, like this DJ is on it. He just released this album that was one of the top on the charts. He plays a lot in the New York scene. He is a highly sought after DJ on evenings and weekends. But during the week, he's known as David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs. 
So how cool that this guy, you know, he has he has become a DJ. And if all he ever did was DJ, he would have enough gigs, he has enough demand that he could make that a full-time career and be really good at it. But he's also the CEO of Goldman Sachs. And it gives him a whole other perspective where his employees meet him on a different level because they think what he's choosing for his hobby is so cool. And so he's giving them permission to really have fun and not take themselves so seriously. What he, the clothes that he wears to work at Goldman Sachs are very different than the clothes that he wears when he's a DJ. And it is an outlet for him. I listened to an interview that he gave and he was talking about like, this is my free space. It's where I play. It's where I have fun. And yes, I have fun at work, but very different. I make the decision at work and it's not the decision that the, the consequences are pretty steep. And I, that weighs on me. That's what he said. This is what weighs on me. But when I'm in the DJ world, I make a decision and I play the wrong song, like the wrong song where it doesn't get the greatest response. No big deal. And so it becomes his playground and he has a great time with it and he's become very good at it. And so how cool is that? Not only that he's doing it, but also what's he teaching his employees about how they get to really perceive themselves and just, just be fun and be joy. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to walk into Goldman Sachs on a Monday after DJ D Soul has been DJing all weekend. He has probably lit up. I know for me, I love playing in the transformational space. I volunteer, volunteer an enormous amount of hours to going and playing and supporting others. Because where else in the world are we cheering other people on at their highest possibility? So tonight I'm going into a, a module, a, a learning session for two hours and it will light me up. Will I have dinner with my family tonight? No, but they all know that mom is the best version of herself when she's in spaces like this, that when I go to read them books before bed, when I go to give them a hug, I will be lit up. And something that's taken me many, many, many years to figure out is that with kids especially, it's about quality over quantity. And when we went back to that question a few minutes ago, where we said, why is it that if we know that having a hobby is really important, this is important stuff, why don't we choose it? What we just said is a big one. With kids, it's about quality over quantity. But oftentimes we get those metrics mixed up. I do at least. And I pick quantity over quality. And I think it's about the amount of time, not the quality of time. And when I get that way in my head, when I let myself go there, I trick myself into thinking that I've got to be around my kids all the time and I get to be with their every need and I get to support them in every way. And I forget that supporting my kids is also leading by example. Sometimes it's saying, I love you so much, but I'm not going to drop you off at camp because I'm going to go hang out with my friends at this conference and go learn, which is exactly what happened with me last week. As much as I love that drop off point and giving my kids hugs and telling them, I love you, I'll see you later. Instead of doing that at the camp doorstep, I did that in the morning before I left. Then I went on my trip, they went on theirs and we reconvened on Saturday and it was awesome. We all were lit up because we all got to have these moments of excitement. It is not about quantity. It's all about quality. And so when we look at the time that we use, because guess what, guys? That is the only finite piece in our lives is time. We are all guaranteed that we're going to die. It's no secret. We just don't know what the end date's going to be. There's a famous saying, again, I don't remember who said it, but you've got your birth date, you've got your death date, you've got the dash in the middle, and the dash is how we spend our lives. And on a funeral, on a cemetery, you guys know my mom died in November or in October, and the dash has never been in front of my face as much as it has lately. I go and see her, her tombstone, and I see that dash, and I know how she lived. And it's a constant reminder to me of how I get to choose to live not based on how somebody else thinks I should, but how I want to. Because at the end of the day, the only person that's judgment that counts is mine. And I am the harshest judger. And yes, I, from a higher theory and, and God, we can have a whole conversation about that. And, and just so you guys know, yes, I absolutely have a belief in that. And so for you, that's your own belief. That's your own system. That's your own questions to have. But for me, I think about my life gets to be about quality over quantity which means that when I'm with people, I am 
present in the moment. That's a practice. It's not always how we show up, but it's a practice. And so it's giving ourselves opportunities to be present. And where can we practice presence? We can practice it in hobbies. We can practice it in hobbies. Guys, we're going to go on a quick break. When we get back, we will wrap all of this up and put it all together. You are listening to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership here on Inspired Choices Network. Enjoy this quick break. Are you enjoying the conversations on the Kathleen Reeson Show? Kathleen speaks both in person and virtually at companies, conferences, and retreats all over the world. Learn about booking Kathleen Reeson for your next event at KathleenReeson.com. That's KathleenReeson.com. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, pushing the boundaries of leadership. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Kathleen Reeson Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. Kathleen Reeson here. And we have talked over the last 45 minutes about the value of having hobbies, why they're important, what we could use as examples of hobbies. And now what I want to share with you is how do you actually create space around you, like within your companies, to for hobbies of your employees? Here's a statistic that just blew my mind. So burnout. Okay, burnout, meaning we're, we're exhausted. We show up for work less than our highest productivity. It's costing companies, get this number, $125 to $190 billion, okay? So burnout is costing $125 to $190 billion annually, but, but billion with a B. That's crazy. It blew my mind when I saw that number. That is astronomical. And the reality is that, one of the biggest steps in alleviating burnout is to create space for our employees to be in joy. It's why I spent the last six weeks in this joy series. But what I know to be true is that when we give them space to have fun on their own and together, it will light up our offices, light up our offices. And so some of the different ways you can do that is create opportunities together. For example, Friday afternoons, Maybe those are the time where you create office opportunities. So it could be a scavenger hunt. It could be, uh, it, it could be a, a boat ride. You could get boats. You could go kayaking. You could go on a walk. You could have a picnic. There's all kinds of options. And for those of you that are in virtual environments, no problem. There's all kinds of stuff that's on virtual that, that's existed for a long time. But even more so now, there are game shows. There are companies that you can hire that will send your employees specific boxes and they have all this stuff curated in them. And then you guys can all enjoy a, an escape, you know, an escape room. So it's a mystery that you get to solve. They actually, you get this box at your doorstep. Everybody gets a box. Everybody has different clues. And it's a curated game where the, the employees can actually solve this. And it's really fun. So you can create community and connection regardless of whether you have in-person contact. That's something really important. I was just on a meeting the other day. I was at a conference last week. And they said, can we create connection if we're not together? And the overwhelming response in the room was, no, we got to be together. And that, you guys, that's just not true. You can create con deep connection regardless of whether you're in person or not. And it's because we attempt at it. We, we, it definitely doesn't require different tool sets. 100%, 100%. There's a story I've been reading, uh, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. So maybe you've read it. If not, read it. I'm only about halfway through. It's a book that I've thought about for years. And for some reason, I just grabbed it. And I was reading that the first few pages, it talks about this gold miner. He decides to, that's not his profession, <laughs> kind of a hobby, kind of a search for what's next for himself. But he says, I'm going to go be a gold miner. He goes and gets himself a piece of property. I think it was in Colorado. And he's not from Colorado. So he starts digging for gold. And he finds a little bit of gold. Gets really excited because there's a lot of gold here. But he needs equipment to get the gold out. So he covers up the gold. Doesn't tell anybody about it. And he sneaks back home. And he goes to his family and his neighbors and says, I found gold. I found gold. But he says you pay the money for me to get all this equipment, you pay it, then I can go get the gold. So he's whispering and he's telling them all about it. And the family and the friends are like, yes, we're going to be rich. So he gets all this equipment. He goes back out to his share 
And he starts digging again. And he finds the gold orb. He's super excited. He has made it rich. He's digging and he's digging. And all of a sudden he loses the gold orb. The gold orb is that streak of gold that, that it's the path that gold follows. And he lost it. He digs around for a while. He attempts to find it. He cannot find it. And so he slumps his shoulders over and he goes back home. And on the way home, he sells his equipment and his share to this junk farmer. He says, it's not worth anything, but here you go. He sells it for such a low price. And the junk farmer says, oh, okay, whatever. It's a good deal. Guy goes home, tells his family and his friends, I'm so sorry. We have a little bit of gold, but I will pay you back. And so he does. He spends the rest of his life paying him back. And you know what that junk farmer does? The junk farmer, he hires an engineer. The engineer that knows how to find the gold orb, he looks around and he realized, he realized that that other guy that was digging, he was three feet away from the gold orb. Had he just spent a little bit of money and hired the, the engineer, he would have seen that he was three feet away. I mean, how crazy is that? The, the junk farmer hears this, digs down, finds the gold orb, strikes it rich, and he goes back to the original miner and he says, you were three feet away, but you stopped. You were three feet away, but you stopped. And that miner, he says, I lost that one, but never again will I lose that. Never again will I stop early. Never again will I let myself quit. I will keep going. And so he used that lesson in his hobby. His hobby was gold digging. He didn't do it. I mean, he thought it might strike rich, but he did it as something that, hey, could I do this? Would this be fun? And he thought he lost. I really did because he quit, but he was three feet away. And he ended up becoming an insurance salesman. He said, I'll never take no for an answer again. I will always go deeper. I was always go that extra three feet. And he was very successful at the end of his career. <laughs> and I just, I think about that story a lot. And I think about how many of us get stopped at three feet. And oftentimes when we are, when we are digging our heads for the answer, when we're beating our heads against the wall, when we're at work and we're talking about metrics and decisions and timelines, and we're just beating our head against the wall. Sometimes, almost all the time or all the time, I'm even confident saying all the time, when we stop focusing on the challenge, we let ourselves go into a state of joy. We go do something that has nothing to do with what the problem is. The answer comes to us. The answer comes to us. And what that's called is you're getting in the flow state. So if we were to go deeper into some of those, the nomenclature, we'd say that's your flow state. So if you love bowling or you're Richard Branson and you like kite surfing or chess or you're Warren Buffett and you want to play the ukulele or you're you and whatever it is for you, when you stop thinking about what the end answer is and you just let yourself be in a moment of joy, the answer will come to you. And isn't that the most beautiful thing, the most beautiful space that the answer comes to you in those moments when you aren't even asking yourself, but when you state what you want, when you, when you put it out there and then you let yourself just have fun, be in joy, that's when the answer comes. It doesn't come when you're beating yourself, your head against the wall, when you're attempting to figure it out. And so think about that. If you're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, or maybe even 40 or 30 or whatever that looks like for you. If you don't have a hobby, if all you're doing is caring for kids, focusing on work, really, really being in a space where I'm just giving and giving and giving and giving, the person that you're not giving to is you. The person they are giving to is you. And so that's the thing that gets to change. You want to create greater success? Focus on your hobbies. Get yourself a hobby. Next week, we're talking all about improving your decision-making skills. How do we make critical decisions quickly? There's actually a four-step process that we're going to walk through. This is, this is something I've been asked to create and give to you guys. It's something that I talk about on a big stage, and I'm actually going to deliver it here on this stage. So I'm really excited. There's a whole course I've developed on this exact same thing we're going to talk about next week. So make sure you tune in. We're, we're live every Monday at 10 a.m. Central Time. So next week, improve your decision-making skills. Thank you so much for being part of the Kathleen Recent Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. I look forward each and every week to delivering content to you straight from my heart. So have a phenomenal week. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Kathleen Recent Show, Pushing the Boundaries of Leadership. Kathleen Reeson will return next Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Central, 
9 a.m. Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Have a great week.